Hello, my name is John Golan, and we're going to be reviewing part two of my series on aircraft performance and mission analysis, which will focus on some basic performance calculations and the underlying mathematics behind them. Now the cornerstone of any performance or mission analysis calculation lies with the drag polar. And today we're going to be reviewing a classical drag polar. There are modified versions of it, but you get the essential gist of it in the underlying mathematics from looking at either form. And the drag polar can be broken down into a series of segments, beginning with the zero lift drag coefficient, or the parasitic drag, and the induced drag coefficient, or the drag due to lift. Now the induced drag, in turn, can be broken down into the lift coefficient squared, divided by the aspect ratio of the aircraft, which again is the wing span squared divided by the wing area, and the Oswald's efficiency, or the aerodynamic efficiency of the aircraft. In order to be effective, the drag polar has to account for a number of real-world effects, the first and most obvious of which is that the wing reference area is fundamentally a somewhat arbitrary geometric quantity. It's what you would get if you were to extend the leading edge and the trailing edge of the wing all the way to the aircraft's center line. This means, in practice, that things like the wing cross-section, as well as the integration of the fuselage to the wing, and whether you have a canard configuration versus a conventional tail configuration, all have to be book-kept into the aerodynamic efficiency. The parasitic drag coefficient, in turn, will be a function of the airplane wetted area, the coefficient of friction, including things like whether or not you have a lot of rivets popping out of the skin, as well as Mach number effects, such as transonic drag rise. The aerodynamic efficiency, in turn, is going to be a function of the wing geometry, including the cross-section and aspect ratio effects, as well as wing fuselage integration. It also will be a function of the Mach number, and will change with aerodynamic loading, or GF loading. So, what we're talking about when we look at mission analysis is to break a complex mission into a series of segments that can be individually analyzed for fuel burn. So effectively what we're doing is we're flying an airplane mathematically through a simulated mission. Now we can get a sense for what this means and how this is done by looking at a relatively simple relationship such as the Brejot range equation. And from this relationship we can also get a sense for how you could influence the range of the aircraft. Now, the range equation relates the initial airplane weight, which is the weight at the beginning of the cruise segment, to a final airplane weight, which would be the weight after the cruise segment, in a logarithmic fashion, which means that this is a very nonlinear relationship. We can see that we can also affect range by the velocity of the aircraft, which is to say as velocity goes up, as you have a higher cruise speed, assuming again that everything else stays a constant, if you could somehow push up the cruise speed a little bit, you could increase the range of the aircraft. Similarly, we see that range is inversely proportional to the thrust-specific fuel consumption. This is logical. If I have lower fuel consumption, I should get better range. And we can see that the range is also related to the lift-to-drag ratio. And buried in that lift-to-drag ratio, of course, is the drag polar for the aircraft. Now, this relationship, the Brejo range equation, is going to be accurate for so long as that the velocity, the fuel consumption, and the lift-to-drag ratio remain constant throughout this flight segment, which, again, is somewhat of an approximation. And as we mentioned before, the lift-to-drag ratio itself is closely related to the drag polar. If we're going to actually perform a mission analysis, we're going to want to break the mission down to some finer segments. And we'll be writing the equation a little bit different from the Brejean range equation, something similar to what is seen here for a constant altitude and speed cruise segment. Now we can see in this relationship that we relate the final weight, or the end weight from each mission segment, back to the initial weight for each mission segment. And we can see in this relationship some of the same components that were previously witnessed in the Brejo range equation 
such as the relationship to fuel consumption, the relationship to cruise velocity, and of course the distance traveled. We also see that the lift to drag ratio, which is again can be related back to the drag polar, is a direct component of this calculation. And in order to do a real mission analysis, we're going to want to repeat this for many different mission segments. And some of these mission segments, such as the crew segment, we'll probably want to break down into smaller pieces as well. Part of the beauty of the foregoing relationships is that they allow us to make some fundamental trades and comparisons without necessarily having to perform all of the detailed analysis of a full performance or mission profile study. So for example, currently Boeing is developing a 777X, a extended range, more fuel efficient version of the 777, in which they will increase the wingspan of the aircraft, among other things, from 212 feet 7 inches to 235 feet 6 inches. So that's almost an 11% increase in the wingspan. Now, we saw in the foregoing relationships that the range of an aircraft is directly proportional to the lift to drag ratio at cruise. So the maximum lift to drag ratio of an aircraft can be related back to the components of the drag polar by the relationship that you see here. So this again relates lift to drag back to the aspect ratio, Oswald's efficiency, and the parasitic drag coefficient. What this means in practice for the 777 is that increasing the wingspan by 11% also increases the aspect ratio. Remembering again that the aspect ratio is equal to the wingspan squared divided by the wing area. Now assuming that the wing area for the two versions of the 777 remains constant, as a first order of approximation, we would conclude that an 11% increase in the wingspan will be related directly back to an 11% increase in the range of the aircraft. So this obviously tells us, fundamentally, this is a very good thing for range. Which, of course, leads to the question, if it was so obvious, why didn't Boeing do this before? Well, it's those darn structures engineers who just won't let them extend the wingspan and the aspect ratio of a conventional metal wing beyond where the 777 already was. So to go to this higher aspect ratio, they have to go to a composite structure. And this is part of what the composite structure buys them, is the ability to go places like this that translate directly into greater efficiency for the aircraft. More range, better lift-to-drag ratio, lower fuel burn for the same range, all of that packaged together.